Okay, so our next speaker is ba Bart Oldman, <laughs> and he's going to tell us uh, about the, their setup at Compute Canada. Welcome. Thank you. So welcome everybody. I'm, my name is Bart Oldman, and I, I work at an, uh, as an HPC analyst at uh, McGill HPC Center from McGill University, which is collaborating inside Canada and Kalkul, Quebec, and then Compute Canada is the basically the collaboration of all academic supercomputers in Canada. So what I'm going to present is how do we deal with software on our supercomputers. And we, we combine various te technologies, software solutions that have been uh, covered already before, particularly in Kenneth's talk. Um, and uh, they're, all, they're all open source, so it, it, it fits really well in FOSDEM. All these four things, CVMFS, Nix, Elmod, and EasyBuild are all uh, present on, on GitHub, actually. So what, what we're going to in Canada is a bit of an upheaval of our supercomputer infrastructure. That's kind of the motivation uh, that we're, we're, we're moving from a system where pretty much every u research university had their own little compute cluster, and some had bigger ones, to a more national setup where there are basically four bigger systems and one, one cloud system. And the four bigger systems, Simon Fraser University, Cedar, University of Waterloo in Ontario with Graham, uh, Niagara at University of Toronto, and uh, a new system in Quebec, uh, which is called Beluga. So just to give you an idea of the scale of the system, um, the, uh, the Cedar system in, in, in Vancouver has... Uh, about 900 compute nodes going to be extended soon with 625 nodes and also about 500 uh, TPUs. Um, so, so that together gives about 30,000 total compute cores to work with. The Graham cluster is quite similar. It has uh, a few more compute cores, but fewer TPUs, about 35,000. Um, and the new system in Toronto will have 60,000 cores. So these are in the HPC world, they're kind of, they're not uh, top systems in terms of the top 500. You won't find these in the top 10, but you will find these in, in, in the top, top 100 or somewhere. So what, what we're trying to present to our users is when they log into one of these new clusters, they see a similar software environment. And because Many of these new systems are actually um, um, pretty much every supercomputer in the world is running Linux by now. So you think, okay, well, they're all running Linux, so they get a, a similar interface. Well, in practice, that's not the case. Whenever you go to uh, another supercomputer, you'll find that th there are very many minor differences in how to operate them. They're not very portable between each other. So we're trying to to avoid that by distributing the software that's used on our clusters um, and combining four different solutions. One is a, a distributed file system called CVMFS. One is a package manager called Nix to, to try to have some, some base software setup that's independent of the underlying Linux distribution. And then we have easy build to install scientific packages. And then there's something called a module tool, LMOD, So I'll get to in a minute. So the background is really, if you log into an HPC cluster, you will find that it runs some, typically in almost all cases, an enterprise Linux distribution. And in most cases, that's either CentOS or Red Hat Enterprise. Sometimes you may see a SUSE cluster, uh, even rarer is an Ubuntu cluster, but they typically don't run Fedora. And one of the troubles with that is that they tend to be relative dinosaurs well, in the open source world. Uh, there are very many clusters who run Red Hat 6, uh, which has a 2.6 Linux kernel, TC 4.4, TLIPC 2.12, Python 2.6. So that is really like you think, ah, I'm, I'm going in a time machine, I'm going 10 years back. But that's, that's just the way they work. It's for mostly for vendor support. Vendors will say, I have a driver for this particular system, and they typically include all the enterprise distributions. And also, Fedora has two, two new releases a year. You don't want to upgrade your OS on the cluster twice a year. It's just way too much work. So, so nowadays, 
production clusters of a couple years old, they tend to have six. The newer ones tend to have seven. But users, some of which may run Linux at home or at their office, want something newer. And they may run Fedora 27 or some Ubuntu or you name it. So they read instructions. They try to run their software, which is not included as an RPM or whatever in the underlying Linux distribution, and they read the documentation. And documentation has a little section about Linux. They go to that section, and the section says, oh, if you want to run on Linux, it's simple. Just do sudo apt-get install Python 2.7 dev to get Python 2.7. Because as I mentioned, Python 2.7 is not installed by default on Red Hat Enterprise 6. So they try to do that command. They get a little lecture about sudo. We trust you have received the usual lecture, etc. It boils down to three things. And then it asks them for the password. Well, they have a password, so they type the password. And then it said apt-get command not found. Said, ah, why is apt-get not there? Oh, I'm running Red Hat. This is not Ubuntu. OK, but Red Hat has yum installed. So I'll try to yum install. Oh, OK, so sorry, user GSM is not allowed to execute this. Sometimes they get a more, sometimes they, uh, it, they get something meaner, they say, you're not, not allowed to do this. This incident will be reported. It depends on the version of sudo. I don't know which, which one does what. So they send, a, they send us a, an email. They say, either they say, can I please have root access on your cluster? <laughs> or they say, I'm so sorry for typing sudo. Now this incident will be reported. Uh, please don't report me to the FBI and the CIA. <laughs> So <coughs> what, what we do to alleviate this problem is modules. So what does a module do? So what we do is we install many commonly used software packages in a, uh, in a location somewhere on the shared file system, which is not in slash user slash bin or some other OS controlled location. And we call that a module file. And these modules files have been around for a good 20 years or so. And you'll find them on pretty much any HPC cluster. So what you do, this is the, 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 the old TCL module file syntax, is that you, you write a little file that you put in a central location. And you specify where is the root of where I installed the software, like the prefix that I used to do configure. Um, and in this case, it's for Python 2.7.9. This is an existing module for our old system. Um, and then. You put a few guidelines in that module file, and then the module command, which is called module load Python slash 279, will modify these four environment variables, man path, path, LD library path, and C path, so that once they load the module, they can execute that software by just typing Python, and they get Python 279 instead of Python 266. Same for, uh, same for C path and LD library path, this way they can. Uh, they can link to development libraries from Python. Um, nice thing about modules, that can, modules can be unloaded, so then the module unload will say, hey, oh yeah, the Python module has added these paths, so now I unload, so it will be removed from the path, and I'm back to my original situation. Because there are multiple versions, you have Python 3.6.2 installed as well this way, and then you can do module load Python 3.6.2, and it will take precedence over the or their Python. So the thing with modules, how they got installed in the past mostly is by hand. And this gives uh, some advantages. As you can see on the right, this is something, some idea I got from, from Kenneth. This is a, a nice little comic strip. And Kenneth got with us up and other people at uh, Urgent. He wasn't the one who started it. But basically, they came up with a solution is to why does every why does every cluster in the world write their own module files and install it by hand? There's a lot of duplicated effort. Let's let's work together and get an automated solution that basically takes the recipe, installs the software, creates the module file, and you're all set to go. Then you can contribute the recipe back, and others can 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 use that knowledge. However, the problem is then. If you adopt that, you are no longer invaluable, so it may not be the best for your job security. So 
At Compute Canada, we took that a step further and we're not only installing, installing a few scientific packages via modules, we basically replace the whole user stack. So we have the bottom, bottom layer. This is, this is basically CentOS 6 or 7, uh, has the OS, kernel, daemons, anything that's privileged. We don't touch these. We basically replace anything that's in the user space that is not privileged, so it doesn't get, get too many security issues either. And we install many base packages like GNU, libc, autotools, make, bash, cat, ls, all crap, uh, find, you name it. They're all installed using Nix, the package manager, and then accessed via a, a specific Nix profile, like some sort of prefix with a symlink for us behind it that we put over here in the CVMFS shared file system location. We have a few custom profiles when there's multiple versions of the same tool that we want to make accessible. And then we have many things installed via EasyBuild. There's usually scientific applications, high-level applications that depend on MPI that run in parallel. Yeah? Uh, are you bootstrapping uh, EasyBuild and Nix? Yeah. Uh, yeah. We have to bootstrap Nix because it has a non-standard prefix. Otherwise, it would start with slash Nix. So we cannot use any of the binary caches that Nix provides. We have to do everything from source. Um, so the, and, and the advantage is then that we can have multiple architectures. Not all of our clusters have the same architecture of optimal performance. We have multiple trees depending on the, on the architecture. So uh, which is not the case for the next layer. All these three layers are architecture independent. Well, they're all x86, but we don't have any other clusters. And we don't plan on that either. So the, the distributed file system is something that comes from CERN, from uh, originates from higher energy physics. They have a lot of software to process their, their collision experiments, which are then treated in data centers around the world. So they've been, they've been, they're used to distributing software for, for quite a while already. And they use the a distributed file system that works on, on top of the, uh, it's a FUSI plugin, so files, file systems in user space. And uh, it works quite well. It has a lot of redundancy built in for a distribution layer with multiple caches. So the idea is here, we build our software on a build node. Then we push it to a central distribution node, which is called the stratum zero. That, in turn, replicates it into a, uh, a set of stratum one nodes, which of, in Canada we have two, soon three of them. And then they get, in turn, replicated on the squid node, which is local to the cluster. And then the client node can mount that file system. And even if some of these stratum ones go down, uh, you still have access to your files because of the multiple caching. So what you need, basically, to mount these systems is a, a, a public key. And then once you have the public key, you can mount the file systems. And you can use the software. We have a special restricted repository, too, with some commercial things that not everybody's allowed to see, and only people have a very specific, what we call LDAP structure, with very specific UID mapping can see. So the other tool is Nix. It was briefly covered in Kenneth's talk at, uh, at 9 AM. So this is how we can actually provide a newer user space than what's provided by by CentOS. We're actually tracking a September 2016 release. At some point we can upgrade it, but we can upgrade it. It's a control by us instead of whatever, whatever Red Hat does. Um, so, so we have a fairly new GLibc and CCC and core util stack. And so, so, so people will see all the newest bells and whistles for the most part in the default stack. So that's in the, that's in the path when people log in. The next tool we use is EasyBuild. This is for the more scientifically oriented modules and LMOD, which is a module tool much like uh, I, I presented earlier, is that we have uh, environment modules, an older solution, and then LMOD is uh, a re-implementation of modules. In LMOD, in Lua, that's why it's called LMOD, um, LMOD doesn't have a shiny logo, but it comes from TAC. 
and this is Texas uh, Advanced Computing Center. Robert McClay who works there, so I just put the tech logo here. Um, so we use Elmod for the software hierarchy. It's nice because there are multiple implementations of MPI to do parallel programming on the cluster, multiple nodes, and if you don't do a module hierarchy, you get many modules. You get, you get, for instance, a popular um, parallel package called Chromex. You might have a Chromex for OpenMPI, a Chromex for MVAPH2, a Chromex for Intel MPI, and they all show up in your module listing. So you get a very crowded module listing with one module for every MPI flavor and multiple versions of the MPI flavor. It quickly gets out of hand, so that's why we have this, this hierarchy. The same for compilers and dip multiple compiler versions. So if you have, say, two different compilers, three different compiler versions, and three different MPIs, you get to three times three times two, uh, 18 different modules for the same software package, and you don't want to have them visible uh, by default. So conceptually, what we do is that we fork some Git repositories ourselves. Uh, we have the Nix package for, for Nix. And then easy build is free components framework, easy blocks, and easy configs. The framework is the high level Python script for easy build. Easy blocks is basically a, a, um, a Python script that says, how do I compile it? And easy configs are recipes that basically say, what parameters do I use to compile it? Uh, configure parameters, where do I want to put it? Just little descriptions. So what we do. In our team, we, we, we figure out if some things we go in the mix or easy build in general. If things are not performance critical and are more base, more boring dependencies, they're typically also provided via, via RPMs or, or dev packages and Linux distributions, we install them via Nix. If it's something that is performance critical or depends on MPI, we put in an easy build. Then we build it on the, on the build node using Nix, Env, or EB is the utility you installed. We test it there. We have a test, uh, testing development repository. We test it there, and if everything goes well, we push it to production, and all the users will see it after about 15 minutes. So to get an idea about the difference, there is a gray area between Nix and EasyBuild. EasyBuild is focusing on HPC. Nix is focusing on general software. There's some overlap, and these, these are all packages that are provided by Easy Build as recipes, but we found them to be a bit too low level, and typically we don't expose these as modules to the users because like something like package config, something, we say, okay, it's provided by default, and typically the, the latest version is okay, and we don't really need to provide multiple versions of package config. Uh, there's, some, there's some things we, we may want to move, like new plot is, a, is one where we may want to provide multiple versions. But things like autoconf, automake, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, you sometimes need multiple versions of those because of compatibility issues. Um, but even there, there we can do create a module around a specific Nix version. So mostly, Easy will pr provide recipes for those because the Red Hat the development RPMs were too old, and we, we, we work around that by providing modules, but we work we ourselves work around it by using Nix. Um, another example of packaging that we do is slightly out of this is that we provide Python wheels. So often people want to use uh, pip install some package and say, uh, how do we do this? Some people insist on using Anaconda. We also accommodate for that, but this is just the standard Python setup. And uh, in order to get optimized uh, Python packages like NumPy and TensorFlow and things like that, we provide our own wheelhouse so that when people do pip install some package in a virtual environment, the packets get downloaded from this particular wheelhouse instead of uh, going to the World Wide Web and um, downloading some random binary that may not work so well in our cluster. So some of the statistics. So at the moment, we have a uh, monotonically increasing um, 
list of modules that we installed at the moment, we're about 500 uh, software packages and versions that we make available for users in the scientific domain. Um, and there's many more that have other architectures as well. Sometimes we need to install something from multiple architectures and we do that mostly automatically. So to see where, what scientific tools do we install just to get an idea of the distribution. Um, there's a huge amount of bioinformatics software out there. There's just many, many, many different tools. We install them mostly using easy build. Uh, at the moment we have about 145. There's probably another 145 coming. Um, and you'll see that other domains typically have fewer applications that many people use. For instance, in, in, in chemistry, in molecular dynamics, you have, you have Chromax, you have NAMD, uh, a couple others. We also keep track of module load, so we can say, okay, who's using what software? This is a Gravana interface that basically says, we can see, okay, does, do, do people use a certain module? And uh, if they're no longer doing it, maybe we, it's time to retire that module. Or if we say, okay, maybe that module is too old, is there anybody still using it? Okay, that time's up. So we have a couple challenges, mostly related to the non-standard path. Uh, if you have any questions, I can let you know, but we do a lot of workarounds for that, uh, including a huge module file just to make sure that the software really doesn't look as a user. Uh, and that's basically the other challenge is to, is to hide the, the, the NIC store pass with all their hashes to the users, because if they leak into the user's environment, which may not use NICs themselves, and we do garbage collect, then st stuff stops working. So this is the, the challenge that we combine Nix with something that is not Nix. So internally, it's all super consistent, but when you combine with something else, you may have funny things happening. So I have a lot of people to thank. Um, my colleagues at Compute Canada, Maxime Boissonneau, who leads the research support national team, uh, some Nix experts that we have, and uh, some of my local colleagues and people who maintain easy build uh, and people at the University of Ghent, Juli and Robert Smith also in Canada. Thank you. Thank you. I think we can have one quick question. Yeah. What do you use to maintain the Linux installations uh, on, the, on the compute nodes? The Linux installation on the compute nodes, they're, they're typically provisioned. I think uh, we're using Puppet at the moment. Puppet. Uh, they used to use XCAT on all the clusters and IBM solution. Um, so these are typically provisioned. They, they're all automated. You, do, uh, you uh, provide a, a, a fixed recipe with a bunch of postscripts that, that alter the installation. And so you have an identical installation on those compute nodes. Yeah. What's your method to determine um, uh, if users are still using a module? Well, we, we, we basically, if anytime anybody loads a module, it gets logged. Oh. We parse the logs. Right. One question out back. Yes, we do. Uh, the can question you, is. Yeah, the can, question can you is, please repeat the question? Yes. The question is do you have optimized Python packages? Yes. We have a generic wheelhouse and we have AVX2 optimized wheelhouse, etc. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks.